Well, this week, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced a $1 billion investment to boost the manufacturing of solar panels in Australia. It comes as the Climate Council released a report titled Seize the Decade. And joining me now live to discuss that and more is the Climate Council's Chief Executive, Amanda McKenzie. Amanda, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. So this week's announcement, a good timing, I guess, with your report and the Prime Minister's uh, pledge up in the Hunter. Um, just firstly, talk me through what your report has found? What our report has found is opportunities right across the Australian economy to slash climate pollution and build a 21st century economy powered by clean energy. Mm. So we found that we are already powered by 40% renewable power, which is probably surprising to many people, and we can get to a bigger energy grid at 94% renewables by the end of the decade. So in terms of the Prime Minister's announcement, um, is this what you've been calling for or, you know, a bit more of a manufacturing pipeline for solar mm. panels? Yeah, absolutely. So now 3 million Australians have solar panels. We're calling for it to get to 7 million Australian families having solar panels by the end of the decade. And, of course, that can reduce people's power bills as well yeah. as cutting pollution. And to manufacture it here in Australia means that we get the jobs here, we get the capabilities here, um, and we can use a whole range of our own minerals to build building those panels too. So what would that do over the next five years to sort of address either sovereignty shortfalls or even mm. shortfalls in trying to achieve targets that government or, say, yourself mm. set? Yeah, well, it's an important step and it's great to see the government making that level of investment. And what we'd like to see is investment across the board, whether it's in our clean energy system. We've got some great investment by the government in large-scale renewables as well, large-scale batteries, yeah. but there can be more. And what we found is that there is a lot of opportunities for not just households to go solar, but also for commercial businesses. Every Bunnings roof could have panels on it, but also for existing industry to use, um, to electrify. So yeah. that can reduce their bills and their pollution at the same time. Talk me through the launch you had earlier this week in the suburb of Elphington. I think we've got some, some vision of that. We can show our viewers now you had some um, children there. Obviously, it's all yeah. about the next generation. Yeah. It is about the next generation. And I think we wanted to tell a story that this is about protecting our kids from climate change. Mm -hmm. And we have experienced a summer of pretty extreme weather from flooding to fires to heat waves. But more so even it's about how do we create the jobs and a 21st century industrial base to provide a thriving Australian economy for generations to come. Yeah. So let's look at the opportunities that the sunniest country in the world has to adapt. And um, what was the main message there when you were launching that climate report? The message is we can seize this decade, that it is critical that the, to make good decisions now. Those decisions matter for our kids. And if we make the right decisions, we can set the foundations for clean energy industries that can thrive, that can provide an export base into the future, provide great jobs for our kids. What about state governments? I mean, how are they travelling? We're seeing mm. um, different projects where mm the climate policies are sort of coming a little bit stuck by environmental approvals. Here in Victoria, we've got the Port of Hastings offshore wind project that's a little bit under the cl a cloud because of environmental concerns down there. Um, around the country, there's also similar approvals as well that are being tied up. Mm. The Climate Council got a view on that? Yeah, th there's one really important piece of federal legislation that's being reviewed this year, which is called the EPBC Act. It's our environmental laws. And it is important to get those laws right, both in terms of, um, we'd argue, ensuring that we have no new coal and gas that's contributing to the climate crisis, but also to clear the way for more renewable energy projects that are done right with the proper consultation, etc. cetera, yeah. but to allow us to quickly expand our renewable energy industry. And Victoria as such as a state, New South Wales as well. I mean, which state's leading on this sort of stuff as opposed to mm. um, others? Well, Victoria is one of the leaders, but New South Wales hasn't been far behind either. The states that are far behind, though, are Western Australia and the Northern Territory. But, of course, there's a lot of opportunity for them to catch up. There's a huge amount of sunshine in WA, a lot of space, a lot of wind capacity mm. too. Um, WA could be doing far more in this space. The NT, they just had another approval of the Santos project up mm. there. You've got concerns about that? We do. We have grave concerns about any new coal and gas projects. Right. We don't need them for Australia. They are contributing more and more to climate pollution, which is 
amplifying extreme weather events here and around the world. I guess reliability, though, that's an issue, mm. isn't it? Um, will that will we still see projects get approved because of that? Uh, that the, reliability. We have the existing resources in. Uh, yeah. We'll need some gas in our system, but we have the right amount of gas resources, and the Australian energy market operator has shown that that we can power our economy with renewable energy. Yeah. And certainly, our um, in-depth research that we published this week shows how you can trans transition to a renewable powered economy. Interesting, you say that because obviously. There's some states that are trying to wean off gas for residential mm. properties like Victoria. So a lot of push and pull factors, yeah. Amanda, aren't there? Yeah. Well, and there will be. In any transition, yeah. there will be push and pull. But I think one of the things that we've really heard from the community around gas is people were not aware of the health risks of having gas in their homes, that there's right. a much higher incidence of asthma for kids. So when people kind of look under the hood of it and say, oh, actually, it's better for my kids' health, it's better from a climate pollution perspective, I can save dollars then they're much more open to shifting away from gas. Amanda McKenzie, really appreciate you coming in. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Simon. Amanda McKenzie there from the Climate Council.